So into this world comes something called Agenda 2030 in the SDGs. And as I said at the beginning of my lecture, you may be tempted to say, well, is this really going to do anything? Now, I don't want to you know, be a missionary for the SDGs here today, but I would like to say two things to you that I think are important to think about. Again, zoom out for a moment. Don't look at the boxes in themselves, but look at something quite extraordinary. So at a time when the traditional agenda setting and narrative defining institutions, named the Bretton Woods institutions, were on the retreat and on the defensive, namely structure adjustment was no longer setting the agenda, and the World Bank was no longer simply issuing its gray covers and white cover reports in order to say, well, this is what we now think will happen next. There was the year 2015, where in this whole disarray, suddenly the United Nations became the place where the world actually tried to find common ground. It's a very bizarre, counterintuitive, and certainly not predictive phenomenon. I don't have an answer exactly of why this happened, but not only did it organize four major events during that year, which agreed on the disaster and risk reduction framework in Sendai, a admittedly somewhat limping financing for development, or finance for development summit in Addis, but then came this extraordinary moment where the entire General Assembly adopted, for the first time in 70 years, a development agenda that not only overcame this notion that development is something to do with poor countries and the rich are in another universe. No, it's universal. For the first time in post-war history, do we have a development agenda that is holding every country to account. Extraordinary political generosity by the G77 to say, OK, we're going to essentially accept that we are in one development discourse. And also remarkable that the North, the so-called North, <coughs> accepted that it does not stand outside this sustainable development narrative as an observer, but as an actor that is equally accountable. Secondly, integration. We, and in Sussex, and in summits, and everywhere around the world, have been talking about sustainable development since the better part of the late 80s and 90s. 92, Rio Earth Summit, the three pillars, we spent roughly another 20 years trying to figure out how do you then connect the narrative across the three pillars, overcome this notion of a chronology of development where economics creates the opportunities, then we deal with social inequality as a problem, and finally we get around to sorting out the environment, which is really the luxury of those who've made it. This is a fundamental affirmation of a fundamental challenge to this development discourse, because here every goal carries within it a different notion, the triple helix of development, the notion that you cannot continue in the 21st century in a world of 7, 8 billion people with the kind of consumption and pollution footprint we have, and the inequality, Gini coefficient reality we face, argue that that chronology is the way forward. That is why I look to Agenda 2030 in a very different way than someone say, ah, oh, 17 goals, how can people remember those? And then targets and indicators. <laughs> I look at it and say, this is an extraordinary miracle in the middle of a re-emerging polarity in geopolitics. In the wake of a major financial economic crisis <coughs> and a lack of leadership uh, from state-led actors, the United Nations General Assembly adopts this agenda and gives us a way of looking at development that if we use it, and that is my point, this is not the Ten Commandments to which you bow and pray. This is the foundation. These are the tentative stepping stones on which we walk as we try to create concepts for now implementing this understanding of development. <coughs>